Thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to be here with Rob Travis from Cascade Energy, who will be talking about compressor efficiency and sequencing for industrial refrigeration systems. Rob, would you please move to the next slide? I'd like to take a moment to thank our Seventh Wave members for making today's presentation possible. We are deeply grateful for their support of our online education. And now I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you. My name is Rob Travis. I'll be talking about compressor efficiency and sequencing for industrial refrigeration systems. Specifically, we've got four low-cost opportunities to identify with compressor operation. The first one is increasing suction pressure. Second one, uh, part load control and VI. The third is utilizing econ economizing wherever possible. And number four, compressor sequencing and ensuring that we've got the most efficient compressors operating at any point in time. So going into the first one, increasing suction pressure. To define suction pressure and lift, system lift is a compression ratio of the compressor's suction pressure, the, I'm sorry, the uh, compressor's discharge pressure to its suction pressure. The greater the ratio from the suction pressure to the discharge pressure, the greater amount of energy the compressor utilizes. So if we have a larger ratio with a lower suction and a higher discharge, it uses this much more energy. If we're able to increase our suction and or decrease our discharge, then we're only using this much energy for our compressors. And compressors, as we know, are going to be the largest energy consuming uh, piece of equipment in a refrigeration system. So talking specifically about increasing our suction pressure, the, uh, when we do that, we increase the capacity of the compressor. So by, by increasing the capacity of the compressor, we're making it more efficient. It's able to do more tons of refrigeration for less brake horsepower. If we lower the discharge pressure, we're using strictly less brake horsepower. So when we're increasing the lift, or I'm sorry, when we're reducing the lift, we're getting a higher efficiency, lower brake horsepower per ton. So this chart below here is a standard chart we can get from any compressor manufacturer. And it shows the ratings of brake horsepower and tons for each comp for one per, uh, compressor at a couple different uh, set points. So what I want to point out here, by increasing the suction pressure, if we look at the minus 40 suction pressure on the top and compare it to the same compressor operating at a zero degree uh, suction pressure, and we keep the same condensing pressure at 105 degrees over on the left-hand side. As you can see on the minus 40 scenario, our brake horsepower in blue is 374 brake horsepower, while it's providing 20 or 94 tons of refrigeration. If we look at the compressor efficiency, which we define as brake horsepower per ton, that's 3.98 brake horsepower per ton. Now, if we're able to increase that suction pressure, and this is an extreme example going from a minus 40 suction to a zero degree suction, but the idea is true where if we can just increase it incrementally, we'll still re uh, realize savings. But in this situation, then from a minus 40 to a zero, our brake horsepower, you can see, goes from 374 brake horsepower to 486 brake horsepower. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute. I thought we want to become more efficient. Our, our brake horsepower just went up. But the key is to look over at the tons as well. Our tons of refrigeration went from 94 to 290. And when we look at the overall efficiency of the compressor, we went from 3.98 brake horsepower to 1.68 brake horsepower. So our efficiency vastly improved. We're getting a lot more refrigeration effect out of that compressor uh, for less horsepower. So when we look at being able to adjust the suction pressure, we're going to look at it as doing incrementally. If we're at a zero pound suction pressure, we want to see if we can uh, go up to a two pound suction pressure or a four pound suction pressure. So a rule of thumb for savings on this to calculate what type of savings are on the table the rule of thumb is that there's about 2% compressor efficiency gain per degree Fahrenheit increase in the section temperature. Now that's not per pound increase, that's per degree Fahrenheit increase. So how do we go about doing that? Well, there's a couple different approaches. Uh, first one is simply raising the set point. Um, if we're confident that there's not going to be any adverse effects, we can simply raise the set point and do it in baby steps. We can look at reducing pressure drops or other bottlenecks in the system. If our suction line is uh, too small, maybe we've got some valves with too high of a pressure drop. We can take a look at that and see if we can improve those with the capital project by increasing the uh, suction line size. 
We can look at the evaporators and reduce the evaporator approach. This is going to be another capital project, but if we can get an evaporator that's specified on a 6 degree TD instead of a 10 degree TD, that will allow us to raise our section pressure or section temperature by 4 degrees and improve our compressor efficiency. And then lastly, we can also just look at making sure that we're correctly matching the loads to the right section pressures. So making sure that if we've got a 30 degree room, that the 30 degree room is on the 20 degree section. If we've got a zero degree room, that it's on the minus 10 degree section. The other, thing, the other point I want to make is that this is not a, uh, a process that you can just blindly take and, and flip a switch. This requires commissioning over usually a long time period to make sure there's no adverse effects in the system. This is an integrated system. If you make one change over here, a lot of times you'll see um, consequences over on a different part of the system. And by no means do we want to lose temperature or get bad temperature readings in any of the rooms that we're trying to condition. So you can see in this chart right here, we started over on the left there with about a zero degree suction pressure. And incrementally, it was raised to one degree. It was raised up again to about five degrees, then maybe up to about seven degrees, and then about up to eight degrees. And know each time is maybe a week, a couple of weeks in between. And that just gives the system time to balance out and make sure that we're not losing any room temperatures in the process. The second point I want to make is part load control and VI. The common rule of thumb is you never want to uh, run a screw compressor unloaded when you can get away with it. The compressors are most efficient when they're running at 100% load and least efficient when they're running part load or severely part loaded. So anything we can do to keep the compressors operating fully loaded is, is going to have positive benefits. We want to make sure that one compressor per suction group is dedicated as a trim compressor and we want that compressor to be the most efficient compressor. Reciprocating compressors, although um, there's not too many of them out there anymore, those have really good part load performance. So if the reciprocating compressor, if it's operating at a 50% load, it's using about 50%, maybe 52% power. So a very good compressor to use for your trim compressor. If you have a screw compressor with a VFD, that's going to be your most efficient screw compressor, and that's the one you want to have dedicated as your trim compressor for that suction. VFDs are usually set to... Uh, modulate down to about 50% speed in some cases, and then some of them they go all the way down to a 20% speed. Once you're at your minimum speed, then the slide valve on the compressor will start actuating. The important thing is you want to set it up so speed control is the first method of compressor capacity control, and then slide valve is the second one. When you select your uh, compressor as your slim, uh, trim compressor, you want to make sure that it's the largest one on the section, or at least one of the largest ones. That will allow it to take any load level, whether a large load or a small load, and be able to effectively and efficiently modulate the, the uh, correct capacity that's needed. Um, lastly, we need to optimize the uh, control algorithms and not simply stage the compressors by compressor 1, compressor 2, compressor 3. We want to make sure that we're looking at which compressor selections best match the load for the conditions. We all know in the wintertime our loads are going to go down and you're not going to uh, need as much compressor horsepower. So let's find which compressors in the wintertime are the best ones to use and which compressors in the summertime are the best ones to use and not just let the control system simply stage them up and down accordingly. Here's a chart that shows you a little bit about the difference in the efficiencies of the different types of capacity control. So most compressors, most screw compressors that operate with a slide valve, which is a pretty standard method of capacity control, you can see on this uh, chart right here, as our capacity increases on the x-axis, as it, I'm sorry, as it decreases on the x-axis, our percent full load power starts to, uh, starts to look like a hockey stick as it's going over towards about that 40% line. Versus the VFD, you can see pretty closely hugs that ideal line most of the way down to the lower capacities. So if we take a quick example and look at the 20% capacity, if we go up to the blue line, at 20% capacity, a compressor with a slide valve is at about 42% power. So it's using 42% of its full load power, but you're only getting 20% capacity out of it. If you look at the VFD at that same point, you're at 20% capacity, and you're about 22% power. So you're using about half the power to get the same capacity with a VFD compressor. The other part you want to take a look at is your volume index on the compressor. 
Now there's several different types of volume indexes, and this is either set by the factory when you purchase the compressor, it may be manually, manually adjusted, or it may have automatic VI controls. Um, all three of those can have really big energy impacts. Um, if you have a, a fixed volume index, there's usually not a whole lot you can do about it other than replacing the compressor down the road or having it remachined if it's in fact the wrong VI. Manually adjusted ones usually just have a bolt they can change with the wrench according to the manufacturer set points. And the auto VI is the, the most modern, most accurate way to control uh, the volume index. Now what happens when we have the wrong VI, um, a lot of times we'll see that uh, compressors have a, a pretty good aftermarket appeal and facilities will buy a compressor that's used that may or may not be the right compressor for the right application. So if we have a compressor that's got the wrong VI, we'll say it's got a, a VI that's smaller than what's needed. If we look at the blue line on this graph here, it starts over on the, the uh, green line with the suction pressure. The gas enters the uh, compressor on the suction side. The compressor compresses the gas up. And then over on the discharge side with the blue line, you can see that there's a gap between where the blue line ends and where the discharge pressure is. This means that there's under compression taking place and that the gas at the end of the rotors have to be recompressed over and over again before it actually gets up to the discharge pressure. On the flip side, if we're over compressing, that means as the gas enters the compressor, it goes up and it's actually compressing to a higher pressure than though it's needed. Then it exits the rotors and then goes back down, loses pressure as it goes back down into the common system. Either one of those has a pretty severe energy penalty. There's not one that's going to be really better than the other. They both have uh, energy consequences. So ideally, you want to make sure that you've got the right volume ratio. So how much uh, of an energy penalty is that? Well, it can actually be pretty severe. So if you look at this uh, chart right here, uh, when we change VI, it really does not change the capacity of the compressor. The only thing that's changing is the amount of horsepower that that compressor uses. So looking at uh, the second line, the suction pressure, if we're looking at a suction pressure of 40 degrees, condensing temperature of 85 degrees, uh, the pressure ratio on there is about 2.3. The tons of refrigeration that that compressor, in this example, is capable of is 481 tons. Now, if we change that pressure ratio to 5.4, that's really not going to change our tons. So that, that's going to be a pretty fixed amount. Now, if we take a look at the two different scenarios, in this case, our ideal pressure ratio is 2.3, but in the next column over, uh, we've got a couple different scenarios of different pressure ratios of 2.2, 2.6, 3.7, and 4.8. 2.2 is the closest to our 2.3, so that's going to be our ideal. That's where we want it to operate. And you can see at that area, it'll, um, the brake horsepower is about 301.9 brake horsepower. But if we have the wrong VI, if we look at the extreme and say our V on that compressor is 4.8, that compressor will actually use 455.6 horsepower. So in that case, that's a difference of 153.7 horsepower, and you're getting the same amount of refrigeration. Um, the opposite is true on the next one over. If we're looking at um, volume ratio of um, 2.2, which is giving us, I'm sorry, this is the efficiency of the compressor. So in the same situation, the efficiency is going to be 0.63 brake horsepower per ton versus 0.95 brake horsepower per ton. So that's a 50% decrease in efficiency just by having the wrong volume ratio. So something that's definitely worth checking out on each of your compressors to make sure that the volume ratio is correct. Uh, number three, you want to utilize economizing whenever possible. Um, economizing, as you can see in the graphic here, is being able to take a medium pressure load and inject it into the side port of the compressor. So in this, this scenario right here, we've got a two suction system. We've got our high pressure receiver that's feeding our high temperature recirculator that's then feeding our low temperature recirculator. Now the suction from the high temperature recirculator is coming over to the side port of the uh, compressor and the low temperature suction is coming into the back end of the rotors of the compressor. By adding that side port economizer to the compressor, it makes the compressor a lot more efficient and offers subcooling, and our brake horsepower per ton increases. A lot of compressors these days have the side port um, available from the manufacturer, and it's just a matter of piping it up. And if you have it, just make sure it's operating correctly. In a lot of situations, the side, either there's a lack of understanding of the side port or there's an issue and they've just been turned off with the valves. So just taking a look at that and reopening those. The other issue with the uh, side port is if you uh, have a VFD, 
that really helps out your side port economizing. Because if you have a slide valve uh, compressor utilizing the economizer, once the slide valve hits about a 70% uh, minimum, then that side port economizer actually closes. So the ideal situation would be to have a VFD uh, combined with the side port economizer. Uh, lastly, what we're going to talk about is compressor sequencing. Uh, this goes back to what I was saying about making sure that we are selecting the right compressors to be operating uh, per the load that we have and the season that we've got. So in this uh, situation right here, we've got a handful of different compressors. We've got a 100 horsepower compressor, a 200 horsepower, and a 400 uh, horsepower compressor. So instead of using blind staging, we're just going to do C1, C2, C3. We want to look at our load and sequence it according to the size of the compressors. So we've got the X's located here. If our load is small, we just want to use the 100 horsepower. As load increases, we want to be able to turn off that 100 horsepower, then turn on this 200 horsepower. As the load continues to increase, we'll turn on that uh, 100 horsepower, and so we'll have the 100 and the 200 operating, and you can see so on and so forth. With this situation, for every 100 horsepower increment, we can cycle the different compressors on to best match that load, and what that's doing is making sure that the compressors are all operating at their ne uh, near peak efficiency, which is going to be in that 80 to 100 percent full load condition. So having a sequencing set up with varying size and compressors um, is going to be uh, extremely a lot more efficient than just having, say, your 400 horsepower compressor operating up and down as needed. So in conclusion, the higher suction pressure increases compressor efficiency. Uh, make sure you consider seasonal adjustments or floating suction pressure control. Use the most efficient part load compressor as a dedicated trim compressor. Ensure your VI is properly set or automatically adjusting on each compressor. And utilizing, utilize economizing whenever possible. Lastly, sequence compressors based on capacity and load and not just simple staging. With that, I hope you found this useful. Um, thank you very much.